One of our big topics in economics is the search for allocative efficiency. If we go back to our original economic problem, which is that there's always going to be scarcity and you can't avoid that. Well, the next logical assumption then is to say that when, if we have a scarce amount of factors of production, resources, if we misuse how we allocate those resources, remember the word allocate means to, to distribute. So if we misuse our factors of production, well, this problem of scarcity is going to be made worse. It's going to be amplified. So a simple example is if you think, if you think about your time, and no doubt at some point you have totally wasted your time doing something that you thought you needed to do, but then it turns out you didn't. Maybe you misunderstood what homework was or what the homework was to be. You thought there was a test, but then there wasn't, or you studied the wrong thing. Um, for me, traffic is it. I hate sitting in traffic. I, I, I could be doing so many other things with my time. So when you think about this, we have a scarce amount of time. You don't want to spend all your time studying. You'd rather spend your time doing things you enjoy. So when you misuse your time, it's, it's really frustrating for you because you could have used that time to do something better. So we don't want to, we want to be allocatively efficient which means that we're using our resources, our scarce resources, as well as possible. We can see this on demand and supply, and let's look when quantity supply is less than quantity demanded. So what we can say is that the demanders, the consumers, are saying, wait, those factors of production, we want you to use them in a way that supplies, in this case, more butter. What we're saying is that this price more demand exists than supply. So again, the consumers are saying to the suppliers, we want you to use your resources to supply more butter. And we, again, we signal that, and we give you an incentive by being willing to pay a higher price. Or when quantity demanded is less than quantity supplied, well, now we have excess supply, and this is a little bit easier to see. This one's kind of more of a concept, but here you can actually see that the amount of guns produced, well, there were resources, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship used to, to produce those guns, but at this price, the supply is greater than the demand is, therefore, at that price, the resources that we used to make those guns were completely wasted, okay? Now, you know that I've used guns and butter, and that must mean that we're gonna talk about the PPC. Well, remember when we talked about efficiency in the first couple of weeks of the class, we defined the PPC as 100% efficient. It meant that you would use um, all of your resources or all of your resources were operating or being used at 100%. There was no waste or anything like that. Remember we indicated that any point inside of the PPC meant that you were at less than 100% production. So you were being somewhat inefficient. This would be kind of what we call productive efficiency, which will be a different type of efficiency that we revisit later on. Allocative efficiency is defining efficiency a little bit better. So let's say that this situation is actually what we're seeing between these two other diagrams, where we're producing too many guns, right? There's a lot of guns being produced, and at the same time, not a lot of butter being produced. So we'll say QS here, correlates to QS there. Well, what this means is we would be at point B on the diagram, where yes, we're being 100% efficient in one sense of the word, but if we look at allocative efficiency, the consumers are saying, no, we want less guns and more butter. So we could talk about allocative efficiency a little bit differently, and again, this is defining efficiency better. So looking at efficiency with a little bit more nuance. So moving from B to A would mean producing more guns, right? I'm sorry, less guns and more butter. And again, we could evidence that or we could correlate that to saying, well, we want more butter, we're willing to pay a higher price, and we want less guns. When we look at allocative efficiency on a diagram, we need a few new terms. So, we need to talk about what are called consumer surplus and producer surplus. 
Consumer surplus, in a strict geometric definition, is the area that is created from the price to the quantity, so the quantity here is Q star, and then up the demand curve. We'll see that it's not always gonna be a triangle, but if it's 100% efficient, it should be. Likewise, producer surplus is from the price to the quantity, and then down the supply curve to the axis. So that triangle, we often will draw it that way. Again, that represents 100% efficiency. Well, what do we mean by consumer surplus and producer surplus? If we choose a point on the demand curve, we'll just go here. What, what that point of the demand curve represents is that someone is willing to pay a high price um, for, that, for that good, whatever it is. But because they only have to pay a lower price, whatever the price is, they have what we call consumer surplus. They get the satisfaction, so we use the term utility, and we say that this person has high utility for this good. So they think it's worth somewhere up here, 20 bucks. But they only have to pay the market price of $15. So they get $20 worth of satisfaction, but they get it at a you know, a bargain price of $15. So they have their $20 worth of satisfaction plus $5 in their pocket. So that's what we could refer to as the consumer surplus. That exists all the way down to the point of equilibrium. The same is exactly true for producers. This producer would have been willing to produce this quantity at a low price of eight or nine dollars. Yet, they got to sell it at a higher price, whatever the market price was. So again, they have their satisfaction, they would have been happy at eight or nine, but they also get an additional, you know, five, six, seven bucks along there, uh, in there too. So that's producer surplus. Sometimes it's useful to talk about consumer versus producer surplus when we're analyzing the effects on two different groups of people. Sometimes we don't want to set up that dichotomy, so we just add them together and call it community surplus. And we just say, well, somebody, it doesn't matter if it was a producer or a consumer, somebody would have benefited from that level of production. Um, but you'll notice the area of this triangle, assuming, this, assuming our supply and demand curves are the same at these two diagrams, the area of this triangle would be the exact same as the area of those two triangles. It's just two different ways of looking at the same concept. Well, if we go back to and revisit our concept of the price mechanism, it's price that is going to help maximize um, the levels of consumer and producer surplus, or looking the other way, the level of community surplus. Notice, we can never go further to the right um, we can never make these triangles go further to the right than our equilibrium quantity. Let's see what happens if I set price above equilibrium, which we see here. If I set price above equilibrium, well, the amount that is going to be bought is going to be dependent on the demanders. Yeah, the suppliers supply way out here, but that's got nothing to do with the tools that we're looking at here. So this amount at this price Q gets uh, consumed, so now we see it, our, our area of consumer surplus has shrunk. It's gone from this triangle down to a smaller triangle. So it would have been all the way to here, but now it's going to be a smaller triangle here. We might think, well, too bad for the consumers, but look how good it is for the producers. And that might be true, and sometimes you might want to talk about it that way. But for the producers, what they gain from the consumers does not equal, it's, they don't gain as much from the consumers as the consumers lost. So what we can see is if we look at the producer surplus, so again, it's price to the quantity down to the supply curve. So that area, what we see is there's a missing triangle here. It would have been the whole triangle, but this triangle right here is neither consumer nor producer surplus. Our term for that is welfare loss. Somebody, consumers or producers, somebody could have benefited from better allocation of resources. So when we don't have allocative efficiency, so allocative efficiency is seen here, but not here. When we don't have allocative efficiency, we will see a welfare loss. So we see that when price is above equilibrium. If the price is below equilibrium, we'll see the exact same thing happen. 
This time we're gonna look at it adding the two together. But keep in mind, I could do the exact same analysis here using consumer and producer surplus. Likewise, I could have used community surplus in my analysis here. So with a price below equilibrium, now the amount that gets sold in the market is dependent on the suppliers. That is, when we go across, we run into the supply line before we run into the demand line. So it's dependent on the suppliers, so it's this quantity that is bought and sold. Yes, there is excess demand, but that might be a different analysis that we're doing. Again, right now, we're just looking at allocative efficiency. So at Q, we have to go from Q up to the demand curve. And yeah, this first, this top bit would be consumer surplus and the bottom would be producer surplus. But looking at it from community standpoint, we don't really care about that. All we're gonna point out is that uh, community surplus has not been maximized. That is, we do see a certain amount of welfare loss.